Okay, in this movie, The Thing, you have Palmer, when he sees the head have legs walking out of the room, he turns and says the most famous line in the movie, you've got to be with me. You're kidding me. <laughs> you gotta, which is, I believe, the staple quote for all horror movies to come after The, the Thing, for all 80s movies, hitty horror movies afterwards. Yeah, I think it was it is the line favorite you say, line yeah. from the movie. I think from his from his career, he didn't even say it, but it was his favorite line. It was even used for you Stephen King fans out there in It Chapter Two. There is a thing homage scene uh, with one of the characters' heads being found in the fridge, and it springs legs, and then they say the exact same thing. If I you're gonna do an that. '80s uh, docu uh, or documentary about '80s horror movies, the title has to be from Palmer. You've got because that's the reaction for every war movie, yeah. So we heard gonna... us in Search of Darkness, people. It's yeah. time for a rename. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the thing. We're gonna be talking about it today. It's Scary Movie Saturday. Join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for finding us. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continued support of the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out. So for some great deals to tell us what to do. Today we're going to talk about what I think is the catalyst for 80s horror movies, The Thing. Yes, actually. It's yeah, shirt, it's, yeah. it's, look at the shirt. It's great. I went to them live. Um, so in The Thing 1982, a U.S. research station based in Antarctica is beset upon by a group of potentially insane Norwegians chasing a dog. <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> they rescue the animal only to find out that the dog is actually an extraterrestrial creature capable of assimilating itself by taking over the bodies of its victims. Now they don't know who to trust, who to believe, or who is The Thing. Okay, so it already in the beginning of the movie breaks off one of the most sacred things. You don't hurt animals in a movie, and it just goes... Yeah, the spoiler alert, it's not an animal. <laughs> right, yeah, you're just going to eviscerate them. Right, so uh, this movie was kind of panned when it came out. It was kind of like junkyard horror movies at the time. It didn't really fare very well. 82, obviously, I think is a reaction because E.T. was a big sell. Yep. And here you have a soft, cuddly, big eye, warm alien. And now we're going to do this movie. You're going to have strong reaction because E.T., really was all over the place in 82. Yep, and actor Richard Mazur, who showed up in The Thing, chose his role in The Thing over a role in E.T., really? which made him maybe more of a cult actor. He maybe would have gotten a bit more of a bump from being in E.T., but in 1982, it's funny, because this film came out, I believe, at the same exact time as Blade Runner. Yeah, on the, yeah. opened on the same day as Blade Runner, which also underperformed and Too, undercriticaled. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, 30 years later, we're, we're talking about it as, like, a pinnacle, right? It's 40 years later, we're talking about it as a pinnacle yeah. of, of horror cinema, sci-fi cinema. It's got its bearings because I think even after five years, and people are like, oh, that movie with everything's coming out of everywhere, and all, yeah. So, yeah, it's finally, it's one of those, like, you, you're not going to enjoy it, but your kids are going to love it. Yep, exactly. Let me, let me read it. Like, I took a quote from one of the, the critical reviews here. Too phony looking to be disgusting, hard to tell who's being attacked, and hard to care. This film was nominated for a Razzie. For yeah. worse score. Yeah. And ironically enough, some of the unused music from this film was used in The Hateful Eight, which won Ennio Morricone his Oscar. So, I'm at complete odds with what's going on back in 1982 with critics and fans. <laughs> and I think it's just because of, like I said before, E.T. Yeah. E.T. was a big sell. People, it was a family friendly, it was Spielberg, and it just, anything polar opposite was just going to get eviscerated. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, special effects, we have to talk about, I will talk about it right now, is Rob Button. Mm -hmm. This is one of his, I think, full movies that he did. Was yeah, he was like, like I don't know, he was 22 yeah. when, he, when he did these creature effects. Yeah. And it should be noted that this is if amazing. anyone is to on the credit, set. he yeah. was like 24 hours a day working on this. If anyone is to credit for the success of the thing, at least in today's time period, it should be Rob Oteen who did. Like, uh, there's a lot of things that happened here that he was involved with. Um, he fought for more visibility of the creature. Uh, Bill Lancaster's weird. script had the, the creature kind of taking a jaw. Bill Lancaster, son of Burt Lancaster. Yeah. yeah, and his script had, had the monster kind of in darkness, kind of only coming out when it's needed to be. And it was probably a thing more about concern. This thing doesn't have a budget to do anything like that. Rob Bottin said, no, we have to have more visibility. Carpenter originally planned on having the creature having one design. 
um, in his version of the film. Yeah. Botin said, no, we got to do some like really cool creature effects and really shine it up. The film actually ended up costing, I think, six times. Yeah, six times its budget for the, the thing itself. <laughs> six times as much money ended up being cost on that. So, um, There's a great documentary you can watch on YouTube about this. And uh, John said this is the longest prep, over a year prepping for mm -hmm. this movie. It doesn't which surprise me. Which greatly <laughs> helps. You can prep this movie because obviously you have to build the sets, you got to uh, for the exterior locations, and then you got to design the monsters. Um, Mike Plug, who's from Minnesota, did a lot of the storyboards and designs for monsters. Just mm. went bizarre, which I right. think John liked. He didn't want to do guy in a suit. Yeah, he wanted to have some creature effect. He just wasn't sh like he wasn't convinced on the whole idea of doing multiple creature effects. No in such a way until Botine convinced him. And that's, again, one of the reasons that it inflated that budget so heavily. Right. He's, like <laughs> you said, uh, John Cumber said, I love Alien, but it's, it's still guy in a suit. Yep. I, I did Halloween, still guy in a suit. I wanted something different. Uh, the, the original movie, The Thing, is simply guy in a suit. What you watch, if the, the original, there are opening doors, like, nonstop. I counted, like, 50 times for opening doors, which is a surprise effect when they open one door and then the thing is there. Yeah. But... Yeah, this is a challenge yourself to make something that's not guy in a suit. Yeah, because Carpenter said, he said, he, he adores the original movie, but he said, the only place I know that we can excel, that we can do better than that, is the, the creature itself. That was the, that, That's why his focus was, let's do something with that creature, because it's the only place I know we can beat it. <laughs> and I think maybe that's the right way, way to maneuver around is when you're going to make a, a, a remake of what is considered a pretty classic film, right. uh, to... Figure out what's the one thing you can do better. <laughs> uh, cinematography is uh, Dane, uh, how do you say, Cundy? Dean Cundy, yeah, from Jurassic Park, Park, Apollo 13, recently worked on the Book of Boba Fett. He's still doing it. Right. <laughs> he also did, uh, if you, you know, a lot of horror, but he also did Rock and Roll High with the Ramones and Roller Bogey, which would be required film, filming if I had a film class. That's fair. <laughs> Rock and Roll High School is an absolute delight. <laughs> so, yeah, which almost could go a horror movie on that one, too. Yeah. But, yeah, it, 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 well, he did Back to the Future, too. So mm -hmm. he knows how to, God, if he did any, any movies Dean was in part of, right? Yep. So, but you have to set it up where it's, the creature's not almost in the forefront, but it looks like in the forefront, right? Okay, yeah. Like, it's a little bit of spacing, but it's almost like when the guy in the chair looks like we remember he's like a front, but that's, he's about ten ways from the camera. Yeah, the way yeah. he uses, uh, I guess, I don't want to use the term, I don't think it's forced perspective, but like similar Almost, forced perspective right. in yeah. a way where like You're the, the creature, it. the thing itself is always commanding the screen, and that's Filling regardless out. of of the effect itself, but like yeah. the focus is always on the creature, and it's kind of like, it reminds me of, you know, like a, like a kaiju almost, where like it's, it's, it's in control of the frame, and everyone else is like little tiny people running back and forth in front of it. <laughs> you know, they're always in response to it, but like the thing always has like, fr it's got top billing practically in the movie, you know? Well, uh, if you see, well, hopefully you've seen this movie before we talk about it, because if you watch the movie multiple times like I did, you understand that when Palmer says that line, he's already been affected. So yep. it's a thing saying to the thing about what he can do to himself, right? Or he's masking that, yeah. Well, and it's, it's kind of fun because almost like when we talked about Scream, like it's fun to watch the movie again because in, in the case of like a Scream movie, you want to find out who which killer is doing the killing when in the Scream movies. But then in this film, it's kind of like we want to find out who is the thing when. Yeah. You know, there's even, there's you that moment when the Get your notepad out, and like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my brother used to do this thing when he would read books where he'd write character names on the, the bookmark. And then he'd like to like talk about where they're what they're at and what they're doing, so we could keep track of where they are, kind of like a previously on. Yeah. That would help with this kind of movie. Um, even did that scene where the the dog walks into the room with the the shadow of a person, and he and Carpenter shot that scene with another person who wasn't in the cast, so oh. that you'd wonder who that person was. Yeah. Um, and he's still like to this day he's he's described it differently and who that character is at any given time. So. Uh, the guy who was in charge of the dogs, I can't remember, is Clark. Um, Right? Yeah. Clark, yeah. yeah. Um, said Watch that, Clark. Watch Clark. <laughs> William, uh, but uh, he said the dog that they used was half wolf, half husky. Mm. And he goes, you would always, he'd always do this. It wasn't do many takes, but he would just stand still and observe, which always freaked the hell out of you. <laughs> yeah. He would actually intentionally do that. He was so quiet, but he was half wolf that he would just know that. All of a sudden, he's there, and yep. they use that in the movie, like, "Oh my God, get the dog!" Right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. So it's it's nice. It's kind of weird to know that that dog is actually half wolf. Yeah, it's a funny thing to have that experience because the, because at the beginning of the movie, it feels like a different movie. There's there's 
dogs being chased by crazy Norwegians. And as a crazy Norwegian, I understand. Um, the funny thing, too, is that even when those crazy Norwegians show up at the beginning of the film, they're actually saying what the plot of the movie is. They are describing what the actual, Yes, it's real Norwegian. So right. when the film was actually released overseas, they didn't change that dialogue. So everyone who spoke the language, who saw the film, had the entire film given away in a, a matter of a few minutes. <laughs> it's kind of like in, in, in Danish, Darth means dad. Yeah. So when they watch Star Wars, like, that's not a big... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here, I, what I like about the beginning of the movie, it's like, what spaceship? <laughs> no, it's like, all of a sudden we have the spaceship. And that's a real sh prop. That's yep. not special effects. That's real shooting lights in the multiple takes so you get the effect of it looks like it's glowing yep but if you watch the documentary it is a real spaceship they'll show you and it real does real lights on it oh yeah and they even like that that whole the thing title card is in practical effects work um, it's a garbage bag what i think is i mean i'm one of those guys i love opening titles like if that was yeah. my career choice to be like an opening titles person i would do that so well um, I love a good opening title. But they taped a garbage bag ambience. over a yeah. fish aquarium and then poked little holes so when it went on fire, That's it great. would do the thing. It's so wonderful. I know. I adore it so much. I love a good opening so title. Put, put some <laughs> fog in your fish aquarium, close a lid, put a garbage bag over it, poke some holes into the label, then set it on fire that it only burns Let the... me stress first, remove the fish. <laughs> first and foremost... You really right. need to add that. This harms the dogs. <laughs> Don't harm any other animals. Then, right? Yeah. But there was a number of changes that was made that were made to the original things in the '70s. Producers wanted to basically go for a more faithful adaptation. This is not yeah. inherently a remake of the thing. Uh, this is a readaptation of who goes there. Um, a different word. interpretation yeah. of it. So we should note that um, you know the story has like 37 characters. Bill Lancaster decided to change it to 12, which even 12 is quite quite busy. difficult to manage. There's busy, a lot yeah. of stuff going on in there. Especially when you notice it's 12, 12 burly guys with facial hair. Um, if you have face blindness, you're going to have to struggle with this. In fact, the only female in the movie is Adrian Barbeau voicing the chess computer. So we've oh, got a bunch of dudes there. Don's wife, right? At the time, yep. Yeah, at mm -hmm. the time. Right. As well, everybody wants to dump a drink in the computer when they play chess. Exactly. Ready. It's cheating. <laughs> Isn't it McReady? <laughs> yeah, McCready does that. Way, right? That's how we're introduced to him. It's wonderful. It's a great McReady. introduction. Right. Um, and then introducing a lot of other people because we talked about before Bromley's in this and mm -hmm. um, Keith David. Yep, I love. Yeah, yeah a lot of I always confuse voice. him with David Keith. Keith David. <laughs> Keith yeah. David. Um, also did the voice I think of Spawn the animation series. He did the HBO show there. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies, Cloud Atlas. Uh, he's and the thing is he's most well known I think now for for there's something about Mary when he plays Mary's uh, so the Frank uh, stepfather. Beans. Yeah, how do you get the beat of Frank? It's the, um, the Frank or Beat son. But yeah, I, it's funny, Keith David, we don't talk about his his work with Ooh. John Carpenter in the same vein that we talk about like Kurt Russell's. Right. Keith David did this film, he did They Live, he, like, he, he did some really iconic work in the 80s, and be, maybe it's because he's been so prolific across a number of things. He was in the last season of Community, and he was fantastic. Like, he's just done so many things, he can handle comedy, he can handle horror, he can handle action, like, he just does, he does everything, he does it well, you know? Yeah, in the beginning you have, uh, obviously we talked about it, but they have a helicopter and the gun and then you have enough violence and everything. And this is great helicopter action sequence outside of James Bond. Yeah. So, yeah, that's true. A little <laughs> bit like James Bond. You, know, you all know snow and you got a helicopter trying to kill you and almost dead. Yeah. Well, and being able to capture to the snow, that's not an easy thing to do. No, then to go to like up, like northern Yukon territory or something? I like believe so. I know yeah. most of the inside sets of the film were done on a soundstage. Uh, in yeah, LA, and on the lot, but like the yeah. the uh, the out, outer stuff must have been, yeah, maybe Yukon or, or territory. But getting snow to look good on film is really tough. Yeah. And the film opens with just white snow. And I, I got to say, when I first saw the movie, I was like, oh, this is going to be a little. I'm not, I'm not sure how to feel. And this was during the. I, I saw the movie for the first time back when people weren't talking about it like a really? classic. Okay. Yeah, I picked it up with like on a Halloween whim one night, um, and it, yeah, I saw it like that way. Where I was like, I was part of the group of people that. I, I fell in love with that movie during the 105 minutes. So you, know? you didn't know about the autopsy scene about the... I, God, I honestly can't tell you what I, I knew going into it. I okay. knew that there was a thing. Like, that's, <laughs> I knew Kurt Russell was in it. I knew the poster. I can't honestly tell you if I knew anything about this movie going into it. I didn't even know it was good. Like, it was at the point where people didn't talk about it being good. No. I saw it when it was not good still. <laughs> I still think if you talk about this movie in like 88, people like, eh, that movie. I think uh, it took until mid-2000s, maybe. Yeah. I, I even knew a number of people in college that were like, oh, it's not the bad movie? And I'm like, oh, that was great. Right, because <laughs> right. I think if, even if I was like, you know, 
10 or 12 people like the thing is like that movie though it's just, just let's I'll try to the monster looked like it threw up himself that's what I'm, I think somebody tried to explain to me yeah, yeah and it, I, the sad thing is it's one of those cases where we still haven't learned why the thing is so good and let me explain this in a way uh, I'm a huge fan of the idea and parts of the prequel 2011 the thing I think the story is interesting. It's a prequel movie. It follows the Norwegians. So it's it's a cool idea. Yeah. There's a lot of setup when they actually go to visit the Norwegian camp and they see the axe in the door. You get the moment in the movie where they actually put the axe because in the door. Because they use a little cool. bit of the original of the thing. It's, it's the cool. idea of the original one, but it's kind of like, you know, shelled in a different kind of movie. I think they play off each other really well. But the one thing that's most insane about that is that they shot the film with incredible practical effects that you can see online right now. And then right before the movie came out, they dropped millions in covering the practical effects with CG. What the hell? They didn't understand what works about this movie is that the, the practical effects are the best part. And yeah. you can even you can look it up right now. You can find online all those practical effects. They did them in camera and they look great. And then Universal washed them out with CG, spent stupid. a bunch of money, and the movie tanked because no stupid. one went to see it. God, stupid. <laughs> so we still have not learned the lessons of the thing. Yeah. You know, so four it's years really later. So <laughs> it's practical effects, it, it's authentic, but it's one of those like uh, do I want to see this? And then you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but, right, all the exterior shots are on location, mm -hmm. outside. Um, and then inside studio lot, they built the uh, headquarters inside. Yeah. So a lot of the interior is all at studio. And then they talked about in the documentary how, you know, he had to go with the bowl home. They said to go to lunch, and people are like, what the? Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, it's just made well, up. Well, yeah. what's fun, too, is you got to think, outside it was recorded temps of like 100 degrees that day, those days while they were filming, and then inside they had the temp down. In the studio, so right. So they could get the, the breath as much as they could and try not yeah. to have to, to putz with that. That's the best thing about it. It's like they had to do it in the summer, but then they had to go put their parkers on. I'm not it. sure if you'd get frostbite with that 60 degree temperature change, or if you would get like heat stroke. I don't no, they talked about the documentary, <laughs> how they, a lot of them got the flu, because yeah. they go, they, they go hot, and cold, hot, and cold, right. Yeah, so it's it's what I what I love about this movie. My favorite element at play in the thing is that it's it's the same movie if you remove the special effects, which are great. It's the same story. It's a murder mystery, where yeah. almost anyone or maybe all of them could be the murderer, and like we don't know the number of murderers or who it is. It's a murder no, mystery. It's like an Agatha Christie, you yeah, know, at the dining hall. Who's the killer? You know, and the, the, it's very reminiscent of the fact that they use this music in the Hateful Eight because the Hateful Eight has a very murder mystery feeling to it, yeah. where maybe there's more than one killer in that too. Like you know, there's a lot of interesting ideas at play there. That the movie would be as good if it was just a bunch of guys from in Antarctica, and then one of them gets murdered, and they got to figure out who did it. It would be just as entertaining, but then you also get the incredible special effects too. So it's. It's a ice as cream. You, you know? As you brought that up, it reminded me of Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. Because exactly. they go on yep. an island, the ten of them, and all of a sudden, one at a time, they're all dying. Who's, who's doing all the murdering? Yep. Right. And where are they here but a frozen island in, right. in many ways because they can't I mean, they can't get off. And their murderer wants to get off. <laughs> and I always say when you do horror movies, you got to close in your environment. All horror movies are closing environments. And mm -hmm. this is a perfect idea of closing in your environment. Whoa. Where are you going to go? <laughs> or if you go, are you going to be a problem infecting everybody? Because remember, like, if this thing gets out, remember the computer, if this thing gets out, oh, shoot. Yeah. yeah. It's like if Night of the Living Dead, if, if one of the main characters in the movie was yeah. a zombie at the beginning and they had to figure out who it was. I think <laughs> after people gone through COVID, I think they're going to appreciate this even more because they understand, oh, quarantine, let's keep this here, let's deal the horror, let's not, I, yeah. Yep. I think I'm, I'm going to misquote it because I always get this this quote wrong when I say it. But th this quote like was trending a lot during the last couple of years, and okay. that was uh, nobody trusts anybody, and we're all very tired. <laughs> and I think that, if anything, has to describe the last two years very, very well. Yeah. Is no one trusts each other anymore, and we're all very tired. <laughs> but they did great build of the set because it looks authentic. Because they have like barrels in the hallway. It looks. You know, you got the, they all, I think they hanged out together for a while too. They, yeah, I mean, the chemistry is so great amongst that, that crew that yeah. they had to have been spending some time together. Because I, I can't think of a lot of movies that these guys did together um, oh. prior to this. So there must have been some, some serious interplay. <laughs> and uh, Kurt Russell mentioned the reason that people are upset because they sold the dissection of the thing, which people are a little queasy about, but still. You know, it's, like you said, everybody likes to eat meat, but you don't want to see how it gets made? Yeah. Well, we want to see how the thing gets made, too, so we want to show that people were queasy about that. But 
That's and the other aspect of it. Like, do I want to see it? I don't want to watch it. Ah, I'm watching it. Yeah. The one th- I never felt really all that like just dis- and. I get it. I'm a gore hound. Like, I've seen it all. I very rarely have to pause and walk away right, from this a movie. Right, this movie had, like, a bucket load of KY, yeah. a truckload, right? But I keep thinking to myself, I don't think even when I watched it for the first time that I was struck by the, the graphic content as much as just yeah. in awe of it. And I think part of that is that You've got it's, to be. The, thing is, the thing is not human. And even when it looks like a human, when you cut it open, it's not human. So, like, I've never once really been disturbed by that in the same way that I'm disturbed by, like, an actual autopsy, right. you know, like t- taking place. So it is curious to me that so many people found the autopsy kind of like the blood and gore effects to be disturbing. When I was just more like, this is magical. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna go to the ceiling. What is that? Yeah. 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 And watching them do it too. That this is another movie where watching the magic happen in the special features doesn't take away from it. You know, some movies no. you don't want to have you don't want to have the magic explained. This is one where like when they show like doing stuff in reverse and then like. You know, showing yeah, reverse filming yeah. the th- camera so that the thing like moves up to the ceiling when it was actually moving down. That just made me love it even more. It makes you want to go back and rewatch it so you can catch all that. I know if you watch it, how they made even the floorboards pop. They put like a bowling ball on top of a train. Yeah, they lift it, <laughs> and they just pulled it. But still, how they filmed it because you know the point of view. They looked they just a little shot a long corridor and it's quiet. And you're like, oh crap. Yeah. That's a great effect. You know something's going to happen. Then it happens like, you got to be kidding me. Part of yeah. me thinks that Carpenter was being challenged on budget going over because of the creature effects. And so he just started doing things like, yeah, like, let's just roll a bowling ball down, a, you know, down Under down the, the floorboards. Just... Like, I, I got to think that's probably what's going through his mind. It's like, everything we can do cheap, let's do cheap. You know, get the cardboard cut out of Kurt Russell. Let's put him over here for a little bit. Like, <laughs> Pull out the Roger Corman playbook. Right? Yeah, exactly. We can do it this way or we do it cheap. That's the blessing of being John Carpenter and making Halloween. Four years prior was like, he probably knew, like, how can I get away with as cheap as possible. This actually film is uh, Carpenter's favorite, personal favorite of his films. Um, he said that when I saw him uh, on stage when he did his live show. He said that he said that in so many different ways, and that's why it's kind of funny that he didn't do the music for it. Um, <laughs> right, the art is in CO. And even more Coney, yeah. yeah. Uh, the the now Oscar winner and Razzie nominee. But it's like a heartbeat. Like, you know you should be intense when there's nothing going on. Yep. That's great music when you know even there's nothing going on. Even though they're playing cards at the din- at the table, there's something going on. Yep. Right. And in fact, I love this the score. You think to yourself, the score is not going to be good when you extract it from the film. If you just listen to it on its own. Yeah. When I used to write schedules at my previous job, I would play horror soundtracks a lot. <laughs> I would play John Carpenter soundtracks, and I would play <laughs> Goblin. Um, and so, like, when this one would come on, people would always walk into the office that I'm, like, writing my schedule in and be like, is everything okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just cruising right now. You know, just dun 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 <laughs> So, it's, yeah, I think all the elements, this is a, a movie where all the elements are great, and combining them just makes it better. Uh, before we go, uh, was the thing inspiration for Man of Steel? Because the spaceship up in the... <laughs> I think there was some other anatomical things in Man of Steel. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I went to, just went to see the Man of Steel, somebody and they show that scene and then, uh, in the spaceship in the Frozen, somebody shouted, "This is the thing!" <laughs> <laughs> so at least I got a laugh. Cinematic out of, universe. Yeah, at least I got a chuckle out of watching this uh, Man, of, Man of Steel. Yeah, so, I almost. I, I do wish we got in the sequel. I wish we had. I, I heard some pretty great things about the video game. I played the, the thing too, game. the thing yeah. sequel video game. Yeah, well, there's yeah. there's a there's a sequel video game. There was originally plans for them to do the the thing like getting to like the mainland and then following Childs and and McCready at that point. Um, Childs McCready, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of those yeah. kind of questions of like, you know, could we could we take this somewhere? And then the movie just tanked, like so horribly. I crashed. I do like that ending spaceship. though. We talked about an ending didn't really fit, but that ending fits because. I love that it already won, right? The I love that Carpenter won. has changed his mind up. He keeps saying, "I know what happened, but I'm not going to say it." And then he has, in multiple different times through his career, said it was one way or another. That's <laughs> the whole point of the movie. You really can change your mind; it yeah. still works. That's why I like the ending. You I love like, that people have gone through like looking for breath to see like if that says who it is. Um, there's a great if you watch the the YouTube channel Movie Timelines. Uh, he has 13 unanswered questions about the thing, and he goes in depth on some of that stuff. You should really go check out down the, the rabbit hole. It's fantastic. And he covers the ending and he covers a lot of stuff with it too. Um, Just like The Shining, yeah. you can go down the rabbit hole of overly investigating that movie. Yep, and yeah. I have and I've, re- I've refused to now with the thing. I'm like, I'm just going to enjoy it now. I'm not going to try and figure it. out, this isn't the top spinning in Inception where there's a clear answer. There, This is, uh, this is the thing. This is the, well, that's why it's fun. Yeah. Yep. So, have you seen the thing? Oh my god, you need to. Yep. Yeah, hopefully you have seen it because at this point we've 
kind of ruined the, the whole. And I, like I said, this is this is the launch pad of '80s horror movies. This is what this is where we're gonna go. Yep. And the death of John Carpenter in the studio system. So, <laughs> so it's a whole lot of stuff going on. But we love talking 1982 in science fiction. I can't believe it's 40 it years old. My God. Yeah, and, wa- and, and we're just rewatching it. I, I think I watched I watched it twice in a row in preparation for our talk. And, it doesn't and seem it's, old. Either. It doesn't. No. In fact, I think the thing 2011 seems older just because that CG looks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but let us know your thoughts about the film down below. Do Have you read the original story it's based on, and which version of the film do you prefer? Do you prefer this film over its prequel? I assume so, but if you're a prequel stan, go ahead and let us know in the comments down below, and let us know what your favorite John Carpenter film is, too. Um, while you're down there, as Nick mentioned before, like, subscribe, and check out that Patreon. There's lots of cool tiers available. Yeah, Bill um, Lancaster wrote uh, Bad News Bears and Firestarter, if you want to... Bill Lancaster wrote some some weird stuff like if you just take like he wrote like five things and, yeah. and it's just the weirdest collection of movies yeah, <laughs> we'll do Bill Lancaster month um, but uh, thank you guys for joining us and you can check out all my film reviews at gofilmreviews.com you can find my podcast the St. Paul Filmcast anywhere you find podcasts alright let me look for Brett now